Hi, everyone. My name is Jane. I'm the Senior Director of Sales um, for the APEC region um, here at Remote. I'm delighted to welcome Jenny today, um, Jenny Chi from Zendesk, um, to just very quickly introduce Jenny. Um, she's the Regional Vice President um, of APEC SMB at Zendesk, based out of uh, Singapore. Um, as most of you may know, Zendesk provides a complete customer service solution that is extremely easy to use and scales with with your business. Um, and customer service is really at their kind of centric point. And it's really about your business and your teams too. So welcome, Jenny. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I would love to just uh, spend the next 20, 30 minutes um, to really just understand your views um, on the world of work uh, and your experiences. Um, but welcome. Thank you, Jane. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. Um, let's let's firstly start with just how the world of work has changed. Um, you know, we, we have the pandemic. That's kind of a life altering moment in, in our kind of society, as we know it. But my first question to you would be, you know, Sendis is all about unlocking the power of the customer and the employee experience. How, how do you see that COVID has changed kind of these trends um, for you and where you sit at Zendesk? That's a great question, Jane. I think uh, COVID-19 has definitely changed uh, for most of us, our perspectives of the world, especially from the consumer point of view. Our customers uh, today uh, that we have all across the world, uh, we are noticing three main trends. I think the first is the shattering of brand loyalty. The second is actually the rise of the experience economy. And the third is the access to new technology. And so when we talk about the shattering of brand loyalty, um, we've seen that um, over the course of the pandemic, that has actually been an increase in shoppers that are willing to try new products and services like you and I. In fact, in the last two years alone, 75% of customers have tried a brand that they have not heard of or bought a product they have not mm. thought about buying. Um, and it's really because customers have all flocked online and where the, when they are online, they have really more options than ever before. You and I know with just a click of a button, they can just jump or swap into a new brand easily if that experience that they get doesn't match up to what they expect. And so from that perspective, what that really means is that COVID-19 has really evened out the playing field. And in today's digital environment, customer loyalty is uh, certainly up for grabs. The second is the rise awesome. of the experience economy. And so post pandemic, uh, we have all lost, you know, friends or families, um, you know, through COVID. And people have realized that life is very short. Material goods that define who we were really don't matter anymore. And instead, people are willing to spend more on convenience, value and exceptional experiences. And so what the research tells us is that 61% of customers are willing to jump ship after just one bad interaction with your brand. And this has actually gone up by 22% in the last 12 months. And so um, even, even after two bad experiences, 76% uh, of customers will move their loyalty elsewhere. None of us like losing 76% of our customers to a competitor. Um, and so uh, what we're finding is that consumers like you and I now are comparing us uh, not only to our direct competitors, but to indirect competitors. Uh, think about the last experience that you had at a restaurant uh, or the great experience that you had in a hotel. Um, what they're doing now is they jump completely to a different industry and somebody says, why can't they be as good as this brand? So it's really that mindset shift that has changed. Mm. And then why don't we talk about technology? Uh, for $20 mm. a month today, anyone can get access to chat GPT. And what this means is that AI has actually raised the bar because delivering a fast and efficient customer service is no longer a wow factor, but it's created the baseline of how businesses will be judged. And so companies, we find that companies that win are the ones that actually combine technology with human experiences. And at the end of the day, uh, the word satisfactory is no longer enough. It's exceptional what customers are actually looking for. And the same goes with employees as well. Um, that's super interesting. The the last point around kind of new technology, but also how, how that kind of transfers to employees. I'm curious 
to understand your view on the changes in, in obviously the business landscape, of course, impacts kind of the world of work and how employees engage with work. I'm, I'm curious, again, to understand from your point of view, how that's impacted kind of your employees or, you know, other, other employees that you see, whether that's within your network and, and teams and how they evolve. Yeah, I think the three points that I talked about from the customer standpoint is also very interesting. We flip it around towards the employee standpoint because they, we're mm-hmm. dealing with the same uh, same people, essentially. Um, and so when we talk about the first point, which is the shattering of brand loyalty, you know, you and I are seeing that employees are less loyal to companies now because they also have more options than ever before when it comes to choosing where and how they work. So we've all heard stories of workers transitioning full time into the gig economy uh, or doing freelancing because it does give them that freedom and flexibility to earn a living without compromising on their work life balance. Um, You know, before, um, you know, people would think about really long term careers. But today, uh, you know, people are asking about with companies, people are asking, what do you want from me? What do you have to offer in return Mm -hmm. now for, for the foreseeable future? And then I'll stay here as long as it's working out for the both of us. Uh, which, which, uh, which is interesting because it, it puts that pressure on, on companies to really be able to deliver on the uh, expectations and experience of what their employees want. Which brings me to the next point, yeah. um, the rise of the experience economy. Um, We all know also that Mm. COVID-19 has taken a toll on the physical and mental health of workforces around the world. Mm. Uh, Employees today, uh, they don't just want a good salary. That's that's baseline. Uh, But a great uh, experience working at the company. So, you know, work-life balance, the right culture, the right values. And uh, more importantly, what we're seeing is mobility and flexibility. So 80% of employees, as you know, uh, now desire some kind of level of remote work flexibility. Um, and so, uh, you know, I feel that remote work is, is here to stay and companies that understand this phenomenon are likely to win the war on talent in the long run. Um, and the final part is the access to new technology. Very quickly, I think the pandemic has accelerated the need for upskilling and reskilling. Uh, people want to join organizations that are willing to invest in their development. Uh, And studies have shown that 70% of workers consider learning and development as a crucial aspect of the job satisfaction. Um, And so we talked about ChatGPT, we talked about AI. Uh, And so as companies scramble to figure out how AI can be used in the workforce, we are seeing that uh, employees actually gravitate to the companies that are invested in teaching them those skill sets as well. Hmm. Awesome. On, on that third point, um, in terms of the skill requirements, kind of what you're, what are you seeing in terms of actually now the necessary skills that the workforce now needs to have with these kind of changes, whether that's pandemic accelerated, um, and or just the employee kind of needs and experiences? We are, I mean, I think the, the skill set required to navigate this sort of environment is, is huge. It's been a huge change. First of all, I think, uh, because of the pandemic, businesses across APEC have actually propelled 10 years ahead of schedule on their digitalization mm-hmm. journey. And so digital literacy is really important. The remote work tools that we use, video conferencing, project management software, et cetera, is really crucial. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been in organizations where I saw that peop- um, they're still using PowerPoint version 8, version 9, saving it and not using Google Drive. And so that becomes really difficult uh, when you're working in a remote environment. I think the second thing is really about mm. communication. And so uh, effective communication is really more critical than ever before. Uh, this is not just verbal communication across Zoom, but written how you, how, how you maximize your output while communicating um, and making sure that you're actively listening uh, and being able to convey the ideas very clearly uh, in both written and verbal is, uh, is important. And I think we cannot deny the human portion of it. At the end of the day, empathy Mm. across the Zoom uh, video conferencing is Mm. the ability to recognize team members that may, may, it may be very challenging to detect signs of stress or burnout, you know, when you're on Zoom calls. And so I think the ability to really hone into the empathetic viewpoint and know what other people are feeling uh, across uh, the Zoom is uh, very important. 
great, great points. I would love to now move on to more just broader APAC labour market kind of dynamics and kind of what you're experiencing and seeing that, you know, the war on talent is real. It's, it's everywhere. Um, I would love to understand kind of your view around the current situation of the labour labor market in, in APAC, um, especially around kind of still skilled workers and the gaps there. APEC, as you and I know, we are both based uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very, very um, uh, interesting part of the world. Um, it's complex, but also very exciting. I think, mm. I think the APEC, uh, the the labor market in APEC is evolving very rapidly uh, because of the changing demographics of each country, and with the rising middle class mm. and a more educated workforce, we are seeing younger people move away from low skilled labor like manufacturing um, to higher skilled jobs mm. like the tech sector. A good example of this is China and Japan. Uh, they were once known as the manufacturing hubs of the world because of a couple of things. Firstly, they, they have high population growth and the lack of education and training gaps resulted in low skilled jobs in the factory. But after decades of government investment and intervention in technical skills and a rising middle class, we're seeing a shift towards high skilled labor, in particular, the tech sector. So to give you an example, in 2012, there were only two startups in Asia valued more than a billion. Mm. And today, uh, there's about 170 unicorns in Asia. That's more than mm. one third of the global total uh, number of unicorns. And in China alone, um, despite the fundraising crunch, China actually um, added 74 unicorns to its list uh, in the last 12 months. Mm. And the most famous that we know from China is obviously ByteDance, the parent of TikTok and, and financial mm. group. Um, and so what is clear is that all businesses are racing to fill in the gap of tech talent, which is clearly now the most in demand skill as businesses across the board strive to do mm. more with less. Mm. And in your role, um, obviously Zendesk being kind of a global company and, and companies now have to go global, uh, more so not just from a talent perspective, but market dynamics, competitiveness. Um, I would love to understand from your view, what distinguishes APAC market from other global markets in terms of kind of the labor, uh, labor dynamics? I think APEC is, you know, the emerging region of the world. It, you know, it's, it's going through a phenomenon called technological leapfrogging. Uh, so, um, Technology for leapfrogging is actually when developing economies skip legacy technologies to go straight into the adoption of modern systems. So I'll give you two examples of this phenomenon. The first example is Indonesia. Indonesia is the fourth largest mm. smartphone penetrate, uh, penetrated market in the world. 80% of the population use smartphones. But Indonesia has actually skipped putting in landlines in rural areas and they've gone straight to using mobile phones. So that's, mm. that's really leapfrogging way ahead of the curve. The second example mm. is China. Uh, they've actually leapfrogged the credit card phenomenon and actually moved straight to e-wallets. Mm. So we all know mm. that you know 80 to 83% of all payments are made through mobile payments, WeChat, Alipay. And uh, what we see there is um, that APAC has the ability to very quickly move uh, across technologies because of the scale and the need uh, of, of what it takes to do business uh, in APEC. And so with this, it's very clear that APEC has a potential to jump leaps and bounds ahead of developed economies like Europe and the US. And also, mm. I think what we're seeing is that companies are actually investing in hubs. We have specific hubs uh, in the region where India is like the tech talent hub of Asia. Philippines is the human capital pool of Asia and Indonesia is really the apple of every investor's eye. Uh, with the growth trajectory that they, um, they have. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, uh, sitting in APEC, I'm really super excited to see what else uh, we can do um, as, as a region together. Yeah. 100% um, agree, APEC is, is extremely high growth. Um, but I think just from your examples, talents dispersed everywhere. Um, and again, with, with kind of the acceleration of kind of companies need to go global access to best talent and the talent kind of shortages kind of what's your view in trying to kind of consolidate viable solutions for for our listeners today in kind of tackling the skills shortage and why do you think this is important i think to tackle the skills shortage that's 
you know, evident everywhere. We need to change the way we think about hiring. Uh, we need to move uh, from paper hiring towards skill-based hiring. As an example, it's really no matter, uh, not a longer of a matter of whether a candidate can or cannot use Microsoft Excel because ChatGPT can now do it. Uh, rather, mm -hmm. we actually need talent that's well-versed in AI. Now, the problem is everybody talks about AI today, but not many people have the skills to use AI. In fact, companies like Netflix, I don't know whether you've seen this recently, Jane, uh, they are paying 900 grand a year for AI experts. So it's very clear that there's a huge shortage mm. of this skill set. Um, and to tackle this sh big shortage, we either need to buy or to build to solve this issue. Um, so for some companies, uh, they look at buying, uh, whereby they source from a global pool of talent to fulfill the demand. And for other companies, they need to build, uh, where they are looking at reskilling and redeploying um, and making sure that uh, they are using this, the current skill sets and upgrading those skill sets uh, internally in the company to um, fulfill future demand for those skill sets. But the great thing is that we are not alone. Uh, and you don't have to be alone when you do this because uh, there's opportunity to collaborate with a lot of other institutions. A perfect example of this is the collaboration between industry and educational institutions like Alibaba and uh, NTU, which is a university in Singapore. Um, they have come up with the uh, Alibaba NTU Singapore Joint Research Institute. And this is Alibaba's first mm -hmm. research institute on AI outside of China. And this essentially dovetails with Singapore's ambition to train AI and data science uh, talent to support the country's smart nation vision and its transformation to mm. Industry 4.0. So the crux of it is mm. uh, there's a lot of um, talk about talent shortage out there, but there are ways uh, to do mm. this if you do it smartly. Mm. I want to draw back to kind of what we were mentioning on employee experience and needs. And there's obviously two sides of, of kind of tackling the talent shortage from an employer side, but obviously from the employee perspective. Um, going back to kind of your role at Zendesk and Zendesk as obviously a global company at the forefront of this, kind of what, what are you doing or Zendesk doing to be able to create that positive employee experiences in this hybrid environment that of course, as we mentioned, kind of strategy set, maybe Zendis and other companies are deploying to be able to um, tackle the talent shortage, but also on the flip side, be able to service, I guess, or serve your employees in the best way. You know, a lot of companies look out towards creating the best employee, uh, the best customer experience, but not many companies think about who is providing that best customer experience. And it's actually your employees. Um, and so we at Zendes, we feel that um, when we talk about employee experience, it is as equally as important as uh, customer experience. And so employees mm -hmm. today want to feel supported and they want that seamless and flexible working hybrid environment. Actually, with the move to hybrid, um, HR and IT teams have been put in a very tough spot. The tickets and questions mm -hmm. filed by employees have actually jumped up by 31% in the last year alone. The thing is, as a HR or IT person, you can answer employees' questions, troubleshoot problems, and be that you know single resource that allows employees to do their best work. But you can't really do your best work if you're not equipped with the right tools to do your best work. Mm. Uh, and so at Zendesk, we've realized this for a long time, uh, and we actually help modernize uh, your internal support by keeping employees' requests organized and prioritized. So you can f actually free your teams mm. to focus on the big picture tasks. So things like information sharing mm. with a knowledge center. Uh, it saves time for your IT and HR teams to answer all those questions, right? And then, um, you know, making sure that uh, the HR and IT flows are automated using bots to speed up answer times and using AI to analyze request trends and understand problem areas. So I'll give you a perfect example. Mm. Uh, employees, especially mm. new hires, have a lot of questions when they're onboarding. Nobody likes to answer the same questions over and over again. So we've introduced an internal knowledge center that allows employees to solve problems independently, even before raising the ticket with the help desk. So then, you know, you don't have to duplicate efforts if uh, new tools and policies are introduced. 
And any changes made by HR uh, can be just done in the knowledge center itself um, so that the employees can actually self-serve. And if the employees have a more specific question, uh, we equip our HR and IT professionals with bots, uh, definitely using AI mm -hmm. to really speed up answer time. And at the back end, using AI mm -hmm. as well to analyze the trends. What are the most common questions? What are the friction points for employees so that we can help uh, specifically tackle those problem areas? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, employees mm -hmm. are given, uh, should be given the tools to do uh, what they do best. And that then flows down to the happiness of their customers. Awesome. It's very similar at Remote. We, we are very prominent self-serve motions for um, finding information, particularly in a, in a distributed kind of workforce model. Um, and I would love to take kind of the conversation around kind of getting your view on advantages and challenges out of kind of running or owning a globally distributed team. So in your view, kind of what do you think are the advantages and challenges that, that you've experienced? Obviously Zendesk is hybrid, but you know, every company has had to get distributed at one point in the past two to three years. So curious to know kind of how that has evolved for you um, and kind of where you are now with your teams at Zendesk. Yeah. Um, I think the, there's massive advantages with working, uh, working remotely um, and across global talent pools as well. First of all, the diversity that you have. Don't talk about just diversity in APEC alone, but diversity across global talents, mm -hmm. right? Um, we find that uh, a more diverse pool of talents uh, gets us more skilled and specialized workforce. And the ability to share the best practices across the different countries actually increases the level of creativity and innovation uh, and gives everyone, including leadership, a broader perspective on problem solving. Um, the second part mm -hmm. where every company loves to have, especially in this uh, time right now, is really about the cost efficiency. You're able to tap mm -hmm. into uh, talents that you might not necessarily have uh, in, in country. Um, and you're able to also work around the clock, uh, which means, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're able to do more with less. And at the end of the day, that's what every company wants. They want to increase productivity but also they want to make sure that the employees are happy while doing that. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, when you talk about diversity, there's always the cultural differences. And so you will need to think about how uh, to, to really hone into the different kinds of culture and be empathetic, like what we spoke about, um, to understand uh, where everyone is coming from. Um, one thing that I found pretty difficult is how do you build team building and engagement? Uh, across the board when you have mm -hmm. global global teams. Uh, and so you've got to be a bit creative uh, to still uh, be able to build that culture uh, within the team, but do it very smartly uh, across video conferencing. And of course, um, mm -hmm. there's always the workforce and payroll compl uh, compliance as a challenge uh, because every country is very different. But remote at remote, you've got that nailed down for your customers. So, uh, you know, we're very excited to see what else uh, you guys can bring to market uh, to tackle that challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And just a, a final point uh, before we close off, um, you mentioned uh, some of these challenges. I'm sure as a as a leader, you're you're facing these types of challenges daily. Any kind of uh, word of advice to our listeners? Uh, working in a distributed model or thinking about a globally distributed company to kind of ha how would they overcome these challenges and capitalize actually and lean into the advantages that you've mentioned? You know what? I feel that in the past, this would have been mega challenges, but I do think that as, as we move towards a very rapid technological advancement with AI, AI can help us smoothen out the bumps. Um, you know, for example, we don't have to wait for help anymore. We can go and find the answers our, ourselves and AI can actually help us do that very quickly. I think mm -hmm. the more important thing is really being able to offer that fast and efficient employee support to your employees, making sure that they can find things as quickly as possible. And top of mind is really caring about the employee and really being able to provide the learning and development opportunities as you reskill your employees um, towards catering for the future demand of the skill set that you need in your organization. Brilliant. Well, Jenny, thank you so, so much for, for your time today. Um, incredibly insightful um, from kind of the higher macro dynamics and shifts in APAC down to more tactical 
advice. Um, extremely thankful to you uh, for your insights. Um, any, any last remarks that you want to leave the, uh, our listeners and audience with? I would say if you invest in your people, it means that you are investing in your business. And I think as AI continues to redefine the boundaries of what's possible, the emphasis on flexible work models and the push for personalization will actually shape the workplaces of tomorrow. And I quote this quote from Richard Branson, uh, customers do not come first, employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the customers. And I think as we stand on the cusp of the new era of employee experience, these words have never been more relevant. So it's very exciting times for all of us. Well, I guess uh, that's it, everyone, for kind of our Singapore segment. Um, thanks again, Jenny, for your time. Thanks, Jane. I appreciate it. <laughs>